is Steve Koster with Expresso Engineering. Today we're in Pittsburgh at the IEEE EMC Society Show, and uh, we're happy to be in the Pearson booth this afternoon with Jeff. Jeff, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Steve. Great to see you again. Very good to see you again. Now, what's going yeah. on with Pearson this morning? Well, we're uh, introducing a new product today. It's our Powerline Ripple Detector. It uses the wideband frequency response of one of the Pearson Current probes. And uh, I'd like to introduce Ken Javor. Ken uh, developed the product, and it's best can speak about it and give you a demonstration on it. Very good. Ken, good to meet you. Um, I, I know that there's a lot of power line ripple detector uh, functionality. You're going to tell us all about it, aren't you? Yes, I am. Awesome. Okay. So uh, this is a, a solution to a 50-year-old uh, EMI testing problem. It's audio frequency conductive susceptibility in mill standard 461. It's CS101, uh, RTCA DO160, section 18 and it involves the injection of uh, audio frequency noise on the power input of uh, the test sample. And uh, what we have here is a typical setup. Um, the only thing new and different here is the Pearson Powerline Ripple Detector module. And uh, we're going to walk you through the CS101 test. And over here we have our test sample, which just happens to be an old audio amplifier and a speaker, because it makes for a good test sample. And here you can see the peaks of the AC bus that is applied to it. And as I turn up the uh, audio frequency signal, you'll see it distorting the AC line. I'm going to do that here and just watch the screen there, and you'll see that the AC line is starting to distort quite a bit. And the requirement, the requirement is that this represents 6.3 volts RMS noise. And as you can see, it's very difficult or impossible to judge what the peak-to-peak -peak is, let alone the RMS of that peak-to-peak. -peak. But over here, using the power line ripple detector, we can look at this same signal that used to be looked at on a oscilloscope on a spectrum analyzer in the frequency domain. And here we're separating the power line frequency of 60 hertz from the injected frequency, which is roughly 660 hertz. Now, what we this the white line here is a current is the limit. The white line is the limit, and the limit is derived from the actual requirement by subtracting the transfer function of the device, which is 66 dB from the limit and we arrive at a 70 dB microvolt cursor and now it's abundantly clear and very obvious that we are injecting at the limit. Okay? So if you compare this to what we saw on the oscilloscope a moment ago, it's much easier to determine uh, when we're at the limit. Now, it's probably difficult to hear, but if we put this mic close to the speaker, we can probably hear a little bit of noise which represents the susceptibility of the uh, device. And I'm going to now turn the susceptibility signal down until we can't hear it anymore, which represents the threshold of susceptibility. So, uh, are you about there? Okay, very good. So now, notice that if we look at the oscilloscope display now, when we're at that threshold of susceptibility, it's going to be very, very difficult to determine in volts RMS what our threshold of susceptibility is. But if we now go back over to the spectrum analyzer, we'll be able to see very clearly how much ripple uh, is causing our threshold condition. And in fact, now our, this is our ripple point right there, and you can see, and we can, if we put a marker on that, we could clearly measure it and we would know exactly how much ripple we were putting on. Certainly a lot easier to see in the frequency domain than the time domain. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, this, uh, this technique here makes available a, uh, a very, uh, very important function, and that is that this test, as it stands, cannot be automated. Everybody likes to automate tests to be able to get them done quicker. Oh, absolutely. Um, with this technique, where we separate the power frequency from the injected frequency, 
what we can do is we can put a marker on the injected frequency, command marker to center frequency, squeeze down the span, and you end up with something like this. And once you've got this, you can automate the test because you can use the same automation as you would with like CS114, and you can just level on that guy and then step to the next frequency. So this little device makes automation of this test uh, available. And then finally, uh, it should be noted, as Jeff noted before, this is based on the current probe technology, which means, among other things, it provides isolation so that hooking up the spectrum analyzer does not ground the power neutral. That's very important. And uh, the, uh, there are some other features here which just make this thing easier to use. In the uh, CS101 position, this thing uh, gives a adjusted limit that's flat, clear across the frequency range, even though the limit itself is frequency dependent above 5 kilohertz. So that makes manual testing much easier. And this switch here, which is EUT and power source, uh, is, helps in determining why you can't get the signal at the limit. Sometimes that occurs, you can't drive hard enough to get the signal level to the limit and it may be that the EUT is loading things down, but it may also be your power source impedance is too high. And going back and forth with this switch will tell you what's happening there. Okay. So I think that about wraps it up. Um, and uh, every test lab that does CS101 is going to want to have one of these because it makes the job so much easier. Certainly does look like an, uh, an enhanced way to do the testing. Uh, having done the test myself uh, several times, it looks like a lot easier to do. Okay. I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, that in my lab as well. Okay. All right. Thank All right. you. Thank you very much, Ken. All right.